Good morning. I'm Steve Strauss with the Tetra Tech High Performance Buildings Group. Thanks for joining us today. Before we get started, a few housekeeping issues. All of you should have access to the chat and you can submit your questions there. We'll try to respond at the end of the presentation, but if not, we'll respond with a formal written response when we send out the video at the end. Also, if you do call in, please make sure that you're on mute so you don't disturb the rest of the occupants. With that, let's get started. I'm broadcasting today from the Intel Hillsborough, Oregon facility, one of the largest microelectronics facilities in the world. I'm here today because Intel's holding their owner's form. And I'll be looking forward to seeing old friends and colleagues where about three to 400 of us gather in the auditorium next door. Now I say that, but there is some trepidation about contracting COVID as we all go back to work. Back in March of 2019, the High Performance Buildings Group formed the COVID-19 Task Force and we retained experts from around the world, including Dr. Bonfleth and Dr. Michael Kaiser. Through this process, we learned how to mitigate the spread of viruses and COVID-19. We learned that providing improved ventilation, recirculation, and filtration can substantially mitigate the spread of the virus. So I know by attending this conference, at the auditorium at Intel where they have excellent filtration and air changes, I'm gonna be safer than I am in most spaces. While these strategies are very effective, they also consume significant energy and they contribute to greenhouse gas. That's in direct opposition to the High Performance Buildings Group's primary goal is to mitigate climate change, to be the company that does more to mitigate climate change than any other company in the world. And we do that through using science to solve complex problems. We've learned that technology can help provide excellent indoor air quality at lower energy. That brings us to today's presentation, building intelligence enabling better outcomes for people and planet. You can bring the show up now, Alex. Joining us today is Dr. Andrew Bullmore from Horley. Horley is the largest and latest addition to the Tetra Tech family of the High Performance Buildings Group. This 900 person engineering firm was established in 1862 and as some of the smartest and brightest engineers and building scientists in the world. Our keynote speaker, Dr. Andrew Billmore, is an expert on advanced control systems and real-time monitoring. Next slide. We're all part of the High Performance Buildings Group, which is a division of Tetra Tech, a public company, and we have over 3,000 engineers and scientists. Next. So Dr. Bullmore is going to kick off the presentation. Emer Maloney is going to talk about existing buildings and how we improve their performance. Cameron Sandell, the director of smart buildings at NDY, is going to talk about new buildings and strategies that we can employ today. Tom Collins from Horley is going to talk about the future and new technologies that are evolving and being beta tested. And then finally, at the end, Brian Stern, Director of Energy Analysis at Bluemac, is going to do a teaser on our next presentation on November 10th about delivering net zero carbon facilities. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Andrew Bullmore. Dr. Bullmore. Steve, thank you very much. Um, next slide, please. Um, very glad to be part of the High Performance Buildings Group, as Steve has just uh, alluded to. Um, we might want to define high performance buildings. They might mean many different things to many different people. 
But effectively, they are buildings which simply deliver what they're designed to deliver and are sustainable for both people and the planet in the face of today's demands and are also resilient to future changes. So next slide, please. So I'm going to start today to talk about the imperative, why we want to engage, why we're striving for better performance outcomes from buildings. And if I just summarise three key areas that I think uh, we need to think about, there's the climate crisis and the spotlight that this has shone on building energy performance, now brought into even sharper focus by the global energy crisis. There's the impacts of COVID-19 and the need to deliver quality indoor environments for human health and well-being. And there's the need for reliable evidence um, of building performance for property portfolio investment and management decisions, including the retained value of built assets as we shift from this traditional carbon-based economy to a low-carbon economy. Next slide, please. Of, of these drivers, few, I don't think, would dispute that uh, the most urgent is the climate crisis. In this context, buildings really do matter and the statistics there really do speak for themselves. You know, buildings being responsible for about 40% of the emissions driving climate change. However, of course, being part of the problem conversely means that the built environment is equally part of the solution. And this is especially case, the, the case when we recognise that from a people perspective, our ability to tackle the climate crisis requires an otherwise healthy and economically sound and sustainable society which in turn, of course, is founded on the very built environment that is contributing to the climate problem. So looking to where we are in terms of our energy reduction, the reduced use of fossil fuels in decarbonising the energy market is key to delivering future benefits. But it's only part of the answer, certainly as far as the built environment's concerned. A current best estimates so are that grid decarbonisation will realistically only get us about 40% of the way towards our goal of operational net zero carbon, as far as the build buildings are concerned. So if you, uh, just a click there. Um, we, we must also realise that solution doesn't lie solely in the design of new, more energy efficient buildings. The need to simultaneously address existing buildings is clear from the fact that about 80% of the buildings that we around in 2050 already exist today. Next slide, please. So a dual approach to delivering a net zero carbon buildings is therefore required. However, there's another sometimes overlooked benefit of, of taking a longer term interest in building operational performance way beyond project handover and delivery. Click there, please. And that's the evidence driven design based on lessons learned from new buildings simply won't get us to our destination fast enough. It's too slow. We need to be learning as much as possible from existing buildings to feed back into the design process with minimum delay. And Eamon Maloney in the next talk will give a, a great example, practical example of, of just how that, what that can look like. Next slide, please. So it's all about evidence-based design and operation. However, this shouldn't immediately drive us towards technology-based solutions. As Eamon will also discuss, evidence based on experience is a great place to start the journey. People who, through learned experience, understand building design, the operation of building engineering systems, and the interaction between people and buildings are invaluable assets to the net zero carbon crusade. However, evidencing the effectiveness of any remedial actions and thereafter refining systems beyond the gains achievable by experience based evidence will, at some point, require hard evidence of performance that only technology enabled solutions can provide. Next slide, please. Also, additional considering strategies focused on delivering net zero carbon outcomes, we mustn't forget that buildings exist for people. Buildings are the building blocks of today's societies. But delivering human centric outcomes, as Steve mentioned in the introduction, can conflict with delivering planet conscious outcomes. And experts must therefore work hand in hand with technology derived evidence to strike an appropriate balance and to best manage those tensions so that the best possible holistically sustainable outcomes are delivered. Next slide, please. So with such a complex multidimensional equation to be solved, some means is needed of making accessible the right information to the right people at the right time. Using this information, decisions as to what outcomes need to be achieved can be based on robust evidence. Actions which focus on delivering those outcomes can be taken and importantly, the effectiveness of those actions can be validated. What's imperative here is that the need for evidence doesn't become a roadmap to technology deployment for technology's sake. The robust evidence required to drive and deliver tangible real world outcomes must ultimately be based on purposefully de deployed technology, which delivers fit for purpose data, no more and no less. 
So before I hand over to Ema Maloney to talk about existing buildings, I'd like to end this first talk with a short animation. I hope this will provide a, a useful overview of the issues currently facing the complexity of the built environment. And I also hope that the orchestral analogy will act as a helpful image to keep in your minds as we move through today's talk. Thank you. Most of us now know that insight-led engagement with buildings is fundamental. By knowing what can be optimised, we can be instrumental in the global challenge for better health and well-being and a zero-carbon built environment. But how do we begin to build that insight? Consider every instrument that makes up an orchestra, each a complex piece of engineering, of craftsmanship. It can play its part in a symphony of sound that's harmonious and executed to perfection. But that perfection is hard to come by. It needs every instrument responding to one another, reacting to a conductor who sees the whole picture, someone who expertly holds the entire orchestra in their hands. For too long, data in buildings has struggled to be harmonious. And if it's not inaccessible, it's most often in chaos. Conflicting requirements, contradictory systems, and technology products that fall at the first hurdle have created a cacophony of complexity. The data needed to be able to understand our buildings might come from many different sources, but it needs people who understand how it works together. This data is crying out for a conductor who can not only access these individual instruments, but see how they can come together to be more than the sum of their parts. And most importantly, they must understand the people behind the streets. Humans who think, feel, and bring their own unique viewpoints to bear. Solving these problems, this conductorless data, can only be done when technical know-how goes hand in hand with trust. This is the step towards true harmonious insight allowing us to refine buildings to be the best they can be for the people in them and the planet around them. Great. Uh, thanks for that, Andrew. That was brilliant. And I do love the analogy of the, um, the conductor and the symphony and stuff. It makes me feel very fancy. Um, right. So for the next 10 minutes or so, um, I want to talk a little bit about um, successful measurement in existing buildings and how in conjunction with uh, proper management will lead to successful buildings. Um, and I wanted to kind of kick off with this question about do we know what we're already measuring and what are we doing with that? Um, and sometimes we're we're so focused on getting more and more data. It's all it's everywhere at the moment. It's all anybody talks about. Get the data. We need the data. Um, actually, I think it's worthwhile just sitting back and not looking at what we already have. Um, and for if you can't tell that really obvious analogy there, a metaphor in front of you, we can't actually see the woods for the trees, right? Because when you already when you look at what you already have in existing buildings, there's actually lots already there. And I think one of the reasons we we keep looking for more or feel like we need more is that we're not using what we already have. Um, my name's Emer Maloney and I'm the director and head of building performance for Horley. And I've worked in building performance for over 20 years. Um, and in that time, I've learned a lot about what makes a good uh, building performance. And one of the key ingredients is definitely data. And buildings produce tons of it. A typical building in the last 10 and 20 years will have thousands, if not tens of thousands of data points being logged. Most of this will be through the BMS, but actually there's an awful lot from other sources. Some of those are listed in front of you. And the amount of data already in existing buildings is significant. So I think before we start gathering more, we should take a step back and understand what we already have. And actually, potentially, what, why are we not using it, right? So this data already exists. We agree it's essential to highly performing buildings. So why aren't we using it? And this is kind of the next step of what I want to explore today. Um, and in my opinion, a major contributor, and for those that know me know I've been banging on about this for a long time, um, it's the lack of importance we place on building facilities and maintenance teams. And what we see time and again in existing buildings is that building owners will accept the bare minimum when it comes to building maintenance. And, you know, I've checked, this is common across all regions of the high performance buildings group. It's not just unique to us in the UK. 
and maintenance teams seem to be contracted to, in essence, just tick boxes to make sure things function and we get no complaints. And building owners may suggest that this is financially driven, which it will be partly, but I do believe it's also culturally driven. I did write a think piece on this for Horley a while ago, and um, it's on the website if you want to have a look. But in essence, and in summary, the, we need to get more out of our maintenance teams. We're not using them to their full ability. And we don't do this just by throwing money at it. Money is a part of it, but we do also need to change how maintenance is thought of. I don't think we should be putting maintenance teams in windowless basement rooms, for instance. You know, what is that going to do for your soul? Um, and we see this all the time. There's nothing, uh, maintenance team, there's, there's more that we can do. Maintenance teams have huge amounts of knowledge and potential. And in order to get the most out of our buildings, we need to unlock this. And we can do it by uh, investing in training for them, listening to their ideas and giving them the resource that they need. And in essence, putting them front and center in buildings. And I think once we have this engaged and knowledgeable team at our disposal, we'll find data analysis and understanding much, much more effective. And the urgency with which we need to do this is all the more important now with the advance of net zero carbon. Um, so the steps on the right here are uh, the steps we go through to get an existing building to net zero carbon or to decarbonize it, for instance. Um, and I won't go through all that now. That's probably for the next um, event in November. Um, and all the steps are important. But the one that I'm most focused on and most interested in and the step that um, my team and me, our, uh, our expertise is frequently sought in is step two. So step two involves looking at uh, a building's energy consumption and finding ways to reduce it. And we have to reduce this significantly. So the energy targets that we need to reach in existing buildings now are really, really low. So they can't just be, they can't be reached just by changing in LED bulbs or turning down thermostats. We'll need to do a lot more than this. Um, and to understand what we need to do requires deep technical knowledge of building systems and their performance. And as an example, um, on this next slide, Alex, thank you. Emer, um, sorry this... to interrupt, but somebody's got their microphone on. They need to mute. Sure. I don't think it's coming from me. The noise is fairly quiet here. Ooh. Can we tell who it is? Uh, someone needs to mute. David Gallagher. I got him. Thank you. Cool. Um, right, where was I? Um, so, yeah, an example of how the complexity of getting to net zero carbon in existing buildings. Um, so this is from a Glumac project for California State University. Um, and this is a dashboard explaining the different ways um, and measures we'll need to get to net zero carbon. And I just wanted to draw your attention to the second column there under energy efficiency measures. Um, and to the non-engineer, a lot of this will mean nothing. Like LEDs are there towards the bottom, um, but they are only one part of a much bigger solution. And the, the, solution, the solutions here were derived from both data gathering and analysis and maintenance team engagement. We make it a goal in every project we do to discuss our solutions with maintenance teams because we find that in a lot of cases they've already thought of similar ideas and have already gone through the thought process of how they could be implemented. Um, and as a side note, I think it is worth mentioning the absolute value of these type of dashboards at the moment. And um, they really, really help with scenario planning, both for technical and non-technical people. And um, when we're using them more and more these days. Right, so back to the importance of data. So this is the example that Andrew mentioned earlier. And I kind of just thought it was a good idea to bring you through a real life example of the importance of this sort of data and building knowledge interaction. And um, so in this example, we have um, a scenario where there's an existing gas system and we need to replace it with a heat pump system. And for those that haven't come across this before, heat pumps are an electrically fed form of heating. Um, and it's how, uh, heating or cooling actually, to be technical. Um, and it's how we get a lot of, we will be getting a lot of buildings decarbonized and off gas or oil or coal. Um, and when you start on a project like this, one of the most important questions we need to answer is, what size of electric system do we need to put in? Um, in this case, we have a gas system that can deliver two megawatts. So the obvious thing is to replace it with a system that can also deliver two megawatts. Um, but if we take a step back a minute and talk to the maintenance team and look at data, we can potentially answer a better question. And that better question would be, what does the building actually need? So the maintenance team in passing in this case has mentioned to us that only one of the four boilers ever runs at any one time. And from the metering data, we can deduce the highest loads incurred 
and we find that over a period of a few years, the maximum output ever needed um, was only. Uh, well, sorry, this is a sorry. This is a uh, one of the four was only ever running. Um, next slide, please, Alex. Was only 800 kilowatts, right? So less than half the installed capacity. So the peak load is less than half of the installed capacity. So the next obvious thing to do is to, would be to install a system that can deliver 800 kilowatts. But actually, even still, that doesn't quite tie up with what the maintenance team said. They reckon that only one boiler ever ran and one boiler was less than 800 kilowatts. So we dig even deeper into the data and we investigate how often does this 800 kilowatt required? And actually, this shows us that only 2% of the time is this needed. And in fact, for 98% of the time, the building only needed 450 kilowatts. So we have just gone from thinking we need a solution to deliver two megawatts or 2000 kilowatts uh, to one that only needs 450 kilowatts for 98% of the time. And our solution looks totally different. So we could actually just install that 450 kilowatts and deal with the 2% in other ways. And I won't go into how we would do that, but it is possible. Um, and the message here is that by interrogating the data and speaking with the local teams, we now have a solution that um, has a smaller electrical supply, requires less space to fit in, costs less to run, runs a lot better and more efficiently, and so lasts longer. Um, and all importantly, it costs a lot less upfront. And as everybody likes to save money, I thought I could put some rough figures against this just to get a scale of what we're talking about here. So this is the rough estimate uh, cost I'm in UK pounds of each of those sizes of systems. So we're roughly, you know, going to the 450 kilowatts will save us 450,000 of install. So in the short time I've had, I hope I've convinced you of the benefits of combining both data and building knowledge. Um, and in order to get you to start thinking, <laughs> thanks for that, um, of how to take these ideas forward, I was going to um, <laughs> end on, <laughs> kicked it all off now, end on some uh, good practice examples of clients who already get this. Uh, so next slide, Alex. Um, this firstly, we have a um, company uh, called Legal in General. Um, they're um, in the UK. We're working with them quite closely, and LNG really understand the importance of good FM and complexity of modern buildings as well, and the challenges that, that incurs. Um, and so what they did off the back of that, understanding that the current you know, status quo doesn't work, is they set up a bespoke contractual arrangement with maintenance teams at the heart of it. So they put them front and centre, like I mentioned before. And we're part of that team as well. So they understand the importance of technical knowledge of buildings. And we're doing this across over 40 sites in the UK. Um, not alone, obviously, we have the maintenance teams and we have data software as well, giving us a hand. Um, it's been running for three years now and it's been hugely successful. Tenants are happier and buildings are performing much better. So it's an ideal outcome. And to end on uh, a project we completed several years ago. So this is for the University of Oxford. Um, and we optimised controls across 20 of their buildings um, on the estate in Oxford. Um, and this was slightly different uh, targets for this project. So it was a one off project. So it wasn't an ongoing one like the LNG one. Um, the aim here was just to reduce carbon um, through controlling to optimising BMS controls. Um, and the funding methods and the contracts are very different, but the outcomes were nonetheless impressive uh, as impressive. So the annual savings were more than two tonnes CO2 um, from being emitted into the atmosphere. And the payback was less than one and a half years. But for me, what I'm most proud of is that we did all of this without the building users noticing any change at all. So that's it from me and thank you for your time. Thanks, Emma. That was absolutely fantastic. Great building that as well. Fantastic looking building in Oxford. Um, can I hand over to Cameron Sandal now, who's going to talk about um, new buildings? Sure thing. Thank you, Andrew. Um, good morning or good afternoon, depending on which part of the world you are in. Uh, I'm coming to you from Sydney, Australia, so it's uh, the middle of the night here. My name is Cameron Sandell and I am uh, the global lead for the NDY digital team. And I just thought I'd start by explaining a little bit about what that means. We are a globally distributed team with regular collaborations. We, we deal with fairly high, high profile projects at a global level and, and certainly high profile global clients. And we're operating in a sweet spot around building technology, uh, which of course underpins all of the data that we've heard is necessary for our efforts to hit, hit net zero carbon. Uh, so we operate in building intelligence, uh, comms, security, audio, visual, uh, and, um, and ICT. Next slide, please. 
So demystifying a few buzzwords and intelligent buildings. Um, there's lots of different ways to to get to the end game, I guess. But some of the buzzwords that you'll hear that help us get there are single pane of glass. So we want all of the data to be available in a single location, in a single platform where possible, so that we can then apply potentially analytics and machine learning over the top of it. Uh, user journeys is something that we use to underpin the definition of the technology required. Of course, with all of these different potential technology sources of data. We want to have good quality naming conventions. We need to normalize that data <clears throat> in order to be able to make it available for things like digital twins. Next slide, please. The way we achieve that uh, by design, I guess, is to look at it from a layering perspective. Uh, the bottom layer in this particular model is where all of our physical sensors and devices in a building reside, and we call that the process layer. Uh, we, by design, particularly want these things to sit on a common network, <clears throat> which could be a combination of Wi-Fi or wired, or it could be cloud, but the network layer is all important in the design. The communications layer above that is where we translate the languages that all of these different systems, which are typically disparate, um, it, it, we do the translations into a common, common format. The data layer is where we're storing that data and also making that data, once it's normalised, available in real time. Uh, the layer above, the application layer, is where we can start to apply some uh, some rules or some algorithms over the top, which can then allow us to have triggers from one process layer system causing an outcome in another process layer system. But equally, this is the layer at which we can bring external data in as well. So we've heard that we we want human centric outcomes. This is where we can use uh, web services by way of example to get publicly available information from things like the Bureau of Meteorology, maybe public transport, uh, or maybe a, a tenant a corporate enterprise package, and use that to also influence the outcomes in some of those process layer systems below. The top layer, the presentation layer, is the one we all get to see. So all of that other stuff happens under the bonnet. Uh, but the presentation layer uh, should give us the freedom to choose what device we want, uh, whether that's a mobile phone, a display kiosk, a PC, uh, or whatever. Uh, but we also have the ability there to use different presentation layer software packages. So we may want to use Power BI, maybe a Microsoft Tableau, or web just generic web pages. But whatever that is, they become consumers of the data we've already processed to get it to this point. Next slide, please. Uh, so where do we start? We start by understanding the aspirations uh, of, of a building. Um, and you'll hear two different words describing this type of building, I guess, smart buildings and intelligent buildings. But basically what we're trying to understand is how are people going to use this? <clears throat> and in that people cohort, I'm not just talking about tenants. I'm also talking about facility managers, owners, uh, as well as tenant uh, management. And so what we want to understand is what outcomes are we trying to deliver and therefore what technologies might we be able to deploy to generate that data next slide please so technology enables outcomes um, obviously we've we've talked about collecting the data but now we want to make use of it we, we i did mention in the last slide the aspirations but to give you an example and i'm not going to read through all of these but to give you an example of um, which is relatively easy to understand if we have a tenant who wants to understand when they are the last person on the floor of an evening so that they know that it's time to leave or they know that it's time to organise security to escort them to the car park or whatever it might be. Typically, we think about access control, but access control only allows us to understand possibly when somebody is, is arriving at the building. It doesn't tell us when they've left if we've got free exit. Uh, so we may need to blend two different data sets, maybe even three. Uh, and then when we combine that with the push notification to tell that individual that they're the last person there, we're starting to talk about potentially sending out a text message uh, or an email. Uh, and again, that's that's yet another technology. So we're blending technologies to achieve what seemed on the surface to be a simple outcome. Next slide, please. Cyber security, uh, obviously, with all of this collection of data and all of these devices being deployed is certainly front and centre uh, of our thinking. Uh, and one of the reasons we particularly want to manage that converged network is not only for the sharing of data, but also the protecting of that data and also the protecting of entry into the various systems that we have within the building. So 
cyber security should be uh, at the forefront of our thinking around all of this because as we as we blend all of these things together we we also potentially raise our threat profile next slide please so where are we headed to in the future um we're hearing a lot of buzzwords again out there laura wan api software as a service there's more to it than that iot is in fact going to become the future i believe uh, in devices in buildings we're not there today the market of products is not broad enough or scalable enough but it is coming and as a result of that we need to be thinking about how we support that for both existing buildings getting refurbished as well as new buildings that need to remain relevant for the next 40 or 50 years so we need to be building by design all of these future possibilities and probabilities uh, into our design thinking next slide please so I want to leave you with one last thought around this, and that is that technology has never moved as fast as it does today, and it will never move this slowly again. Thank you very much. Cameron, thank you very much. That was a, a whiz through fantastic amount of information in, the, in an admirably short space of time. So thank you for that. So without further ado, let me hand over to Tom Collins, who's going to give us a glimpse into what he sees the future as being. Thank you, Tom. Thanks, Andrew. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be in the world. My name's Tom Collins. I'm Digital Director here at Hawley. Um, I've been here since around January 2020, uh, just as the world began to change forever. And change is key here. Our industry is changing more rapidly than it ever has before. Um, within the next decade, I suspect the way that we design and operate buildings will be unrecognisable to the way we do so at the moment. I'd like to share just a little bit at a high level, perhaps, um, some of what we're exploring at Hawley and across the High Performance Buildings Group from a digital perspective that really will drive this change rather than merely respond to it. So, um, crucially, why am I talking to you today? Uh, not to give you a long bio or anything, but but I'm not an engineer. My background is not in engineering. I, um, I joined this industry uh, less than three years ago. Uh, and um, my background is, is digital focused. Uh, and in a range of different industries and, and contexts. I was raised, uh, you might say, in the, the school of hard knocks that is fintech, uh, working in various startups, build new, new tech propositions in the financial sector. Um, and since then, I've put together teams to deliver fantastic digital experiences that really give end users um, valuable insights in a whole range of different contexts. And the reason I mentioned this is that whether working in fintech, retail, renewable energy services, for me, a common thread has, has emerged um, and that is really that uh, when you focus on bringing together disparate data sets, you know, from, from all different contexts and layer on top of that a fantastic user experience, you tend to get an outcome that's really be for better, uh, that's really better for all involved. Um, and both ingredients are vital. All too often, though, you know, one or both of those ingredients is missed when it comes to thinking about um, technology enabled solutions. So uh, on to our, um, our challenges as an industry. Uh, in, in building a better uh, built environment. Um, as I said, seismic shifts are taking taking place and we're adapting to them. Uh, whether we're talking about the need to deliver net zero carbon outcomes for our clients or the need to ensure that disasters such as Grenfell uh, never happen again, there are two conclusions that we must draw uh, that give us the imperative to change as an industry. So the first conclusion is that we must design and operate buildings for balanced and convergent outcomes. That is, outcomes that deliver benefits both people and planet, as we've discussed a bit already. Um, and the second conclusion is that the design work that we produce must be informed by evidence and in turn, the benefits must be tangible and provable through evidence. So it's no longer good enough to simply produce reports and rely on those. Um, so ultimately, what's the key point? We as an industry must be designers and engineers who demonstrate outcomes based on evidence. And so that's what we must be. What must we do? Uh, we must converge these two strands and have an end to end engagement with the property life cycle. Uh, across the high performance buildings group, we have a fantastic diverse range of specialisms with an ability to operate at the forefront of both design and operation, as you've been seeing. But now is the time to bring all of these capabilities together on projects in a fully integrated way. Only through such a whole life cycle engagement will it be possible to ensure that buildings do actually deliver their required performance for both people and planet. And so 
um, as an industry, we need to recognise, you know, where must be focused, we must need to recognise the complexities, not just of buildings, but also the interaction between people and those buildings. We need to welcome evidence of real world performance, good or bad, so we can use it to drive better design and better performance. We need to adopt really a high level systems thinking approach to appreciate the whole story, to learn lessons from both success and failure, uh, and to always improve on what's gone before. I talk about copy paste culture, <laughs> this idea that we we often start from a clean sheet design, but then we also, uh, you know, we're moving data into various uh, different pots, uh, and we end up with with a pretty messy uh, situation. Uh, and so, ironically, the the emergence of three D modelling and BIM, as we talk about in in the design side, has in some ways moved the focus away from systems thinking and instead focus on objects and geometry. I believe this is the wrong way to look at our design. Instead, we should be focusing on systems above all else. There's also an inherent problem in our industry when it comes to adopting an end-to-end -end approach to building design, delivery and operation. In my experience, other industries are actually far ahead of us in this space. We have a traditional and highly transactional approach to project delivery, uh, and it's based on files and folders from a, from a practical level. Information is lost during the handover of files between delivery stages. <clears throat> and what makes matters worse is that we actually promote this transactional approach with its inherent data loss as minimizing contractual risk. So what is really needed is a more integrated and interoperable approach, such that the handover between project delivery stages retains all relevant and necessary information as a golden thread. And that across the supply chain, the value chain, we then uh, collaborate on that. So yeah, this is not just the loss of information either. Uh, we create massive inefficiencies with taking this transactional file-based approach. Our engineers and designers end up spending more and more time importing, fixing, exporting uh, various file formats than they do actually producing really good design work. And this has to change. So why don't we turn those files over? Let's give them a shake, see what falls out. Um, and let those objects coalesce into, into much simpler forms and then work around those. So whether we're talking about a project, a site, a building, whether we're talking about levels or stories, all the way down to you know, individual fixtures, fittings, um, and calculations that support those things, simulations, assumptions, rather than wrapping these things all up into disparate files and then getting ourselves into a mess, let's deal with them at that granular level. And so when we move to this model of collaboration on a single source of information, we're doing we're doing two things um, in enabling people to do this. So uh, we're enabling our engineering teams to see the whole picture uh, and focus on what they do best, which is design, test, iterate, repeat, always accelerating through greater use of automation. And the second thing, and it gets better, we begin to actually build a knowledge graph as the design progresses. Um, this results in creating what we might call a design master. In our case at Hawley, we're, we're building that as a, as a platform called Origin. Uh, and um, it's where all design information is accessed via that single source of truth, sometimes referred to, as, as uh, Cameron said, as a single pane of glass. Um, so in effect, a design twin is born uh, long before the physical twin exists. And that's, that's what I'm going to call buildings from now on. It's the physical twin. Um, its, its functionality then replicates the operation of the building being designed uh, through that systems thinking. So a significant benefit of this approach um, is its ready extension to the real world as a building is constructed and then moves into operation. And we could call this the asset twin. And effectively, what we've done is produce digital twin ready design. So once the project passes through the construction phase and real world data can then be fed into the knowledge graph, you end up with a far more meaningful representation of the physical twin, um, the building as it exists in reality. But when we talk about digital twins, we often get stuck on this, this visual, the visible representation. We get stuck on 3D geometry all, um, often and uh, we think of it purely as online dashboards. Um, in reality, the, the true value here is having an underlying data structure in the form of a knowledge graph that represents the system design. Sorry. Uh, and so what you're seeing on screen, so, you know, it's not that um, we uh, the ontology represented by a digital twins knowledge graph can't be overlaid and made accessible via 3D representation, um, as shown here. 
Uh, but 3D alone doesn't simply doesn't provide the insight within a digital twin that a true systems view can. So increasingly, we we try to represent both sides in our design, and this is where you can see the benefits of a, a system view that is directly connected, integrated with that 3D model. So to reiterate, if we as an industry are going to take on a much more connected approach between design and operation, this undertaking is made much easier through a single source of truth throughout the whole end-to-end -end process. Now, I think back to uh, Steve Jobs when he was launching the iPhone, famously talked about uh, on that day launching three revolutionary products. He talked about uh, we're launching an iPod, a phone, a mobile communications device, repeating it end on end until um, the audience had realized that really he was talking about one revolutionary product that wraps all of those things together. And it's the same story here, a design twin, an asset twin, a performance twin, all driven by the same underlying data and all performing in harmony. And so one final point from me, uh, a single source of information does not mean a single experience for the end user. A digital twin platform for use in building operation must be composable and geared towards the outcomes the twin is there to measure. And so at this point, I'm going to hand over back to Andrew Bulmore, who is going to uh, talk through what we've been uh, doing on the digital twin and uh, uh, where that's going to take us. Thanks, Tom. Great run through. Um, can I return briefly to Tom's iPhone reference? And what I'd like to say is, would anyone expect to take a new iPhone out of its box and it deliver exactly what was wanted? The iPhone is a platform on which we install apps to deliver outcomes relevant to our individual needs. Likewise, would you expect to open the box of a building design software and a, and a ready designed building jump out at you? No, building design is about producing unique outcomes based on unique requirements. And that's how we need to start thinking about digital twins in the same way. There are composable software platforms on which solutions to deliver specific outcomes need to be designed and delivered. They're not out of the box solutions. Next slide, please. So, so under the bonnet, digital twins achieve this by mirroring the systems which, which contribute towards those real world outcomes, as uh, Tom was just talking about. They faithfully replicate how those systems interoperate in the, in the real world. So the defining feature of a digital twin is not the 3D system image on the right in this image, but it's the underlying data structure on the left. This is the, this is the knowledge graph based on the building's ontology, which crucially includes not just the real world entities, but the real world interconnectivity between those entities. Next slide, please. So for the past five years, we've been operating our London office as a, a living laboratory to test new technologies in a real world environment. And that's included the development of the digital twin of the office. So I'll briefly overview a couple of specific use cases just to illustrate the sorts of things that we're currently looking at. And the first concerns indoor air quality. And in this example, an IoT sensor detects high, level of, high levels of CO2 in a meeting room. Next slide, please. So the interconnectedness of the entities within the digital twin, which I'll, I'll illustrate in a second, means that the multiple potential contributors to poor air quality can be readily identified. So that ranges from the people in the room, the occupancy, the engineering systems themselves, through to the external air quality. Any one of those might be contributing to that poor air quality. Next slide, please. So this is where putting a, an interface on a digital one really matters. So at the highest level, the detection of high levels of CO2 by the IoT center at the space can initiate a simple alert on a high level landing page. But the beauty then is, and that's of course of relevance to the people trying to manage the building. Next slide, please. But the beauty of having all that connected data together is that clicking on the alert results in much more detailed diagnostic information being displayed. And this highlights the system involved that provides direct access to real-time air quality readings, occupancy counts in the affected room, and direct access to the operational information of the engineering systems. Um, and as in another related use case, air quality information was also incorporated into our COVID-19 driven desk booking apps for peace of mind of staff. So the second use case I'm going to look at is the digital twin platform being used to support the development of our own roadmap to net zero carbon. So in this case, next slide please, the user interface has been specifically developed to allow us as engineers and designers to interrogate the various energy meters to provide ready access to the evidence required to inform our net zero carbon strategy. And the flexibility of the interface that we develop means that we can slice and dice the information in multiple ways that suit the purpose that we're trying to put that information. Next slide, please. We're also embedding existing ana analysis tools into the digital twin platform. And Ema mentioned these, these type of dashboards. 
uh, such as this dashboard for developing our own roadmap to net zero carbon for our own office. You'll see down the left hand side a number of options for action. Other information displayed includes the cost of implementation, calculated carbon reduction, and how the cumulative effects of the various actions may lead us towards the, our emissions target. Next slide, please. However, the devil, as always, lies in the detail. And each of those actions' effectiveness depends on actual demand, which varies hour, hour by hour, day by day, month by month, coupled with the real time carbon intensity of the grid. Hence, it's vital to base overall calculations on fit for purpose data that provides the necessary level of granularity, as shown in this second information place. And this, this example illustrates the carbon savings based on a, a couple of, um, couple of uh, actions with a combination of daylight dimming and on site solar PV generation being introduced. Hence, the major reductions occur during daylight hours and during the summer months. And again, of course, access to real time data via the digital twin platform enables the anticipated effectiveness of any actions to be re readily verified. Next slide, please. So those are just two examples of driving better outcomes based on evidence. But in composing our solutions, we must be ever mindful of the intrinsic link between planet conscious and human centric outcomes, including any tensions. At the highest level, buildings need to deliver positive outcomes for people. They are cornerstones of a thriving and sustainable society. But in turn, society needs a stable and sustainable environment if it is to thrive. At a building level, they exist as a series of often complex subsystems, and one of which of those subsystems is, of course, the people. So whilst building performance impacts on human outcomes, we must never forget that human behaviour equally impacts on building performance. And as we develop technology enabled solutions, this two way interrelationship between people and buildings should never be overlooked. We should also not ignore the interconnectivity between buildings and the wider environmental and societal ecosystems of which they themselves form a part. Next slide, please. So whatever outcomes we're striving towards and whatever technologies we may deploy to achieve those outcomes, the requirement will always be there for the conductors of for the conductor of the building, whoever they may be, to be presented with the right information in the right way, such that they can talk the right, take the right actions based on the evidence presented to them. And they must also, of course, be able to establish whether those actions have led to the desired outcome. Final slide, please, which leads us to our ultimate vision that every building should ultimately be founded on a platform composed by experts, with a conductor or conductors who can balance and optimize each instrument within and which will serve as a foundation to enable better outcomes for people and planet. And I think that's a, a good point to hand over to Brian Stern, who's going to talk about our next presentation. Brian. Thanks, Andrew. So my name is Brian Stern. I'm a director of energy at Glumac. I was so excited to share a sneak preview of our next presentation, which will focus on delivering net zero carbon solutions. I think as we've seen throughout the course of this presentation, technology and intelligent solutions are going to be critical for delivering net zero uh, carbon buildings. Uh, we understand that the framework for reducing emissions can be simple, but in practice and in reality, it can be incredibly complex. There are various different factors um, that impact our decisions and the right solutions for each building, whether those are policies and regulations, technologies, the existing infrastructure, new infrastructure, funding, financing, and return on investment. Um, so we'll dig into these topics in a lot more detail in the next webinar, which will be hosted on November 10th. So we'll feature subject matter experts from across the high performance buildings group and share some of the lessons learned um, of how we've approached net zero carbon on existing buildings, new campuses, and how scale at a campus community or district or portfolio level can be leveraged to drive greater impact. Um, a sign up link has been dropped in the chat and we hope to see you all there. Uh, turn it back over to you, Steve. Brian, what a spectacular presentation. Everybody did great, and we're actually right on time, which is also exciting. Next slide. We'd now like to take the time to respond to uh, client questions, and we're very fortunate to have Dan Wheeler from Turner Construction join us today. Dan is the Regional Vice President for Turner in Northern California and Northern Nevada, and he leads five offices with over 500 of the best builders. Now, Mr. Wheeler recently completed the design and construction of the new natural resource headquarters building in Sacramento. This is the largest project for the state of California, an incredible project that's net zero carbon, lead platinum, well certified. The project also took 
project of the year for the Regional Design Build Institute of America, and it's up for project of the year in the nationals. Without further ado, let me introduce Dan Wheeler. You there, Dan? Juan, can you hear, can you hear me okay? I hear you, buddy. Let's put his image up okay, there. Okay, good. Thank you, Steve. That was a huge introduction uh, and not necessary, but I, I do appreciate it. I, I really enjoyed the uh, the presentation today, and it had me thinking a lot about when we started USGBC and we started talking about buildings, and we were one of the founding members of that. And then fast forward, you know, uh, you know, over a decade, we started to talk about well well being of the buildings, and you guys are ultimately, and kudos to you, pivoting to really talk about the human centric approach you know, to buildings. And I kind of relate that to some of the discussions we had at NNRH over, you know, occupant engagement. And I think that's really what you guys are talking about here. And I just, I wonder if you, you know, the, there's eight elements of, of well-being. I'm wondering if you guys have advanced, you know, some of your thought to, there's so many things that we talked about today, but what do you think the key top three you know, elements of human centric that, that we really are going to dive, dive in on. Andrew, you want to feel that question? Yes, sorry, I've muted. Yes, of course, of course I'll feel it. Yeah, um, Ema, I don't know if you want to respond to that one first. Um, that, thanks for the, the hard one there, Andrew. Um, so, uh, <laughs> So the human centric side of it, I mean, the the, the air quality um, issue, I mean, it is so pertinent right now that it is on everybody's lips and uh, the, the psychological and the physical aspect of that, I think is hugely important. And, and it's something that that's come up on all of the buildings we're working with um, our clients on at the moment. And it's how um, it's how to both give the users comfort, but also not waste energy. Um, and I think what we did when COVID started was we were very reactive and understandably so. Um, and we, we def we, you know, things were turned on, ventilation systems were, were turned on all the time, 24 hours and all sorts of things. And and actually, you know, they didn't need to be in any way. There was, wasn't any benefit in lots of cases to doing that. Um, and coming back from that had actually been quite difficult as well. But what I have found is that actually, once you look into it, the, the, the kind of the health and the people aspect so that they, or the energy or the health side of it and the energy side of it, they don't need to be um, fighting against each other. They can actually work work really well together. So you can have a building that actually in, in, performs really, really well and is really, really healthy. But what you need to make to get to that position, you need to really go into the building in a lot of detail and to find out like, you know, you don't want to just blast the air everywhere. You want to put the air where the people are. Right? So you need to know where are the people and where how are they moving around? So I think they need they can work harmoniously together, but it, it takes quite a lot of effort to do that. Thanks, Ema. I think I would add one other point to that, which is we hear many people saying, well, uh, buildings don't work because the people aren't using them correctly. And I've, I've heard that it's been my third since joining Hawley 30 years ago. And of course, people are people. Um, we should be designing for people. Um, and we can't blame building poor performance on people. So we have to better understand. So I think I think there's a big role to be played in behavioral psychology moving forward in understanding how you get messaging, how you, how, you know, how, how you understand better the interaction of buildings and people, that two way interaction um, and behavioral. I mean, I'll give you a, a, a very good example, for instance, a part of our, our dashboard activities and digital twin activities. We noticed that some weekends we were using exactly as much energy on lighting as we were during the week. And that was because a couple of people going in the office, walking all the way through the office, turning all the lights on, and therefore it was as if we had a full office. And that's that's a behavioural aspect, or actually a little bit of education might actually, you know, maybe to get great gains from from human intervention rather than just te technological intervention. So I hope that's sort of answered your your question. If you've got any others, yeah, I think so. I, I you know, again, I I appreciate the conversation because it's super important. Air quality, I totally agree. And, uh, you know, and, 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 you know, I'll say that you were talking about the interoperability of, let's say, all the systems in the building and how they align. So, you know, and then I would also challenge and just say, you know, also how the occupant uses the space, right? Not just how we design open office concept. Obviously, we've learned a lot from, you know, hybrid workplace and the, you know, the, 
you know, dependence on the technology and having Zoom and team meetings. So I appreciate everything that you guys are doing. I think this dialogue is excellent. And thanks for having me today. Thank you. And I would, I would add one extra bit to that, the, the, point, the point about using space. One of the things we've seen being done very differently since COVID is that um, certainly from our perspective, we're starting to open up offices on a collaborative basis. So you have collaborative, rather than everybody going to a desk and working separately, you have a focus on collaboration meetings. So people go into the office specifically for collaboration. And therefore, I, I think you can begin to drive much more efficient use of space and better outcomes as a result of that. Has, has anyone Andrew, else I wanted to that? add the real time, the real time monitoring that you do where it provides feedback to the people in the office so they know what the air quality is. I think that's been very helpful. I also think uh, the fact that the high performance building group has brought out a psychologist to help us understand and analyze how to design these buildings. I think that's really forward thinking as well, Andrew. Yeah, I, I agree because I think we as engineers and designers sometimes come at it from a little bit um, black and white way and, and actually opening up our minds. I, I, I absolutely think that moving forward, we talk about diversity and inclusivity. It, to me, it's all about diversity of thought. You know, buildings have all different types of people in them. If, if we're not designing them around diversity, then we're not going to get them right and we're not understanding that it's never going to be right. So I think there needs to be a, a, a cultural shift in that regard. Well, Dan, I wanted to thank you and I want to thank everybody for participating in today's webinar. I wanted to remind everybody that our next webinar is on November 10th, where we're going to talk about smart decarbonization strategies. Um, and if you are interested in receiving a copy of this uh, presentation, the video or your continuing education certificate, uh, please respond when you uh, get the email from Alex that goes out to everyone that attended, and we'll make sure that uh, you get both the video and the stick of it and information. So thank you so much for joining today. What a great presentation. So proud of our team. Let's move forward. Talk to you soon.